As a raw visual experience, Apocalypse Now was one of the most impressive movies ever made. It's mesmerising, hypnotising, it's the Blade Runner of war movies in terms of visual aesthetic. So naturally, in preparing to write some studies on Apocalypse Now, one of the things I wanted to do was to get under the skin of that visual style. It's not just a great looking film in an eye candy kind of way, the hypnotic visuals feel like they have some deep meaning, at least to me they've always felt that way. It's as if the cinematography is providing its own narration alongside that of Captain Willard's moody voiceovers. And the same goes for sound effects and music. The soundscape of the film is uniquely hypnotic. Consider these examples. Like with Blade Runner, there are some base sensory patterns that stand out. Both films have a visually animated atmosphere of excessive smoke and dusty light beams. Blade Runner uses dances of mostly electrical light to achieve its hypnotic effect, but Apocalypse Now mostly uses variations on sunlight instead. The film also has a great emphasis on firelight, from Lieutenant Kilgore's campfire scene to the village attack, to a sort of firelit wreckage along the river, to the firelit tribal ritual during Kurtz's death. And the film even begins with a screen engulfing explosion of napalm fire. But the representation of fire extends beyond actual flames. Fire is often presented in symbolic form. For example, there seems to be a lot of orange and yellow filtering in the cinematography. There's lots of moody sunsets too, like firelit skies. And there's lots of yellow smoke and occasionally red smoke. This is from M18 grenades, which were designed to give off coloured smoke in a range of hues, not just yellow or red. And one of the reasons for having coloured smoke was to create signals to aircraft and helicopters, bomb this, land here, etc. There is one instance in the film of a purple haze smoke grenade for a spaced out trippy effect, but most of the coloured smoke in the movie is yellow, with the occasional splash of red. Sometimes these two smoke colours appear orange and pink, but I think that's due to orange colour filters placed over the camera lens. I believe the yellow and red smoke was used again and again in the movie as a subliminal representation of fire, along with the orange filtering of some of the shots, and the frequent use of dramatic sunsets and the inclusion of lots of actual fire, I get the impression that the whole terrain of the film is basically burning in hell. Even in the opening footage of a forest incinerated by napalm fire, yellow smoke creeps into shot first, probably the signal to bomb this. If the aim of the coloured smoke was simply to make the film look beautiful, then why not get the full rainbow spectrum of smoke colours on screen? To have the full rainbow of colours would certainly have added to the psychedelic feel of the movie. In fact, this moment in the script called for green smoke, not yellow or red. There's one moment in the village attack in which a shot of a rainbow is slipped in among the murderous carnage, but other than that, not much in the way of rainbow coloration throughout this movie. Normal, non-coloured smoke is also used a lot in the film, which is inevitable when filming live fire. Sometimes it's used in excellent ways, such as this swirling effect from helicopter rotor blades, but normal smoke is also used in a lot of scenes where there doesn't seem to be a fire source. White smoke in particular is used to create a hazy fog effect, making some scenes come off as transitions in or out of dream states. Sometimes the smoke completely whites out the scene, as often happens in movie transitions between physical reality and dream states. In other instances, moody cloud formations give their own impression of a burning or charred landscape. The dream transition implications of certain white screen smokeouts, I think those are indicators that the story is transitioning into spiritual realms or out of them. The meeting of French soldiers still living in the jungle after their previous war in Vietnam had ended in the 1950s, this whole sequence is bookended by the intrusion of white smoke filling the screen. It's a dreamlike trip into the past. 
After this, the entrance to Curtis's camp at the end of the movie occurs in the same way. The importance of all this dreamy hellfire imagery is stamped into the poster designs for the movie too. It's all oranges, yellows and reds, with one or two darkened versions that are brown and dirty looking. The landscapes are filled with thick smoke blending upward into thick clouds. The skies are like a furnace of hellfire, and in every poster version the sun appears as an impossibly oversized blob, scorching the forest into blackness. Even the choices of props and set decor often are dominated by the colours green for vegetation, yellows and oranges, and browns. Isn't it interesting that the colour palette of the set in which Willard is given his mission to kill Kurtz is pretty much exactly the same colour palette that comprises Kurtz's compound itself? It's the same in Willard's room at the start of the movie too. Look at the prop colours. Greens, yellows, oranges and browns everywhere. Even in a painting above his bed. And the view outside his window. Sun imagery is particularly good in Apocalypse Now because it thematically includes the hellfire look, but also extends into other pathological areas. For example here, Willard's discomfort of being forced to take a shower so that he can leave the shade of his apartment to be briefed on a new mission. His discomfort is accentuated by a cut to strong sunlight combined with the roar of spinning rotor blades. In this shot, sunbeams shine through a murky sky and it's clear that the shot has been choreographed to get those sunbeams in and the sense of some spiritual presence behind those sun rays is enhanced by the music. But this time, it was an American and an officer. The many shots of sunlight gleaming on water behind characters has always felt like some sort of spiritual touch to me. When Willard's narration introduces the crew, three of them are filmed with water-reflected sunlight directly behind them. In terms of continuity, that makes no sense, because the boat would have to be travelling in completely different directions to get the sun into all those positions. Obviously, Coppola wanted the gleams of sunlight to create an aura around each character as they are introduced. And, note Willard's verbal reference to light as well. Lance, on the forward 50s, was a famous surfer from the beaches south of L.A. To look at him, you wouldn't believe he'd ever fired a weapon in his life. Clean, Mr. Clean was from some South Bronx shithole and I think the light and space of Vietnam really put the zap on his head. We get the same use of gleaming light during Lance's surfing sequence. When the crew encounter some Vietnamese on a boat and mistakenly kill them, Gleaming sunlight appears behind most of the characters in blatant continuity errors, like the sun is flipping back and forth across the sky. Interesting that this occurs in a scene where several people die. As for the chief of the boat, though he isn't introduced with gleams of sunlight at the start of the film, after he dies, his corpse is wafted around in the water and set adrift in reflected sunlight, like his soul is fading off into the afterlife. There's a sunlight conceptual pattern going on here, isn't there? In this shot, the sun is behind Willard's head, backlighting him and there are shots of Kurtz himself, either backlit so that he appears to have an aura, which includes the photo of him in Willard's dossier, and Kurtz is eerily lit by godlike shafts of light during his conversations with Willard at the end of the movie. My take on all these sunlight aura shots is that Coppola is pushing a spiritual theme. These people aren't just cannon fodder, these are people with souls. At the same time, I think the sunlight doubles up in places as a sort of Metaphor of divine revelation, if you will, particularly when Willard is reading the dossier on Kurtz. 
Magical looking orange sunlight illuminates the dinner table historical discussions with the French, where they give their insights into the mistakes the US is making in their war effort. Once their discussion ends, the orange sunlight disappears. And a strange play on light is that at the end of the mission briefing, the camera pans from the general to the sunlit curtains in the window. And then we cut to the godliness of a helicopter in the sky. The many high altitude shots of airplanes and choppers are some of the most godlike vistas I've ever seen in a movie. And that god's eye feel is furthered by the cavernous echoing of music and rotor blades. These shots and the open water shots before the boat goes inland via the river all convey a sense of expansive consciousness and mysticism. They convey both great beauty and particularly through the colours a feeling of God's wrath in waiting. It's all a great setup for the spiritual journey about to unfold. More blunt references to religion occur in the form of a half-demolished church in the destroyed village. This is the village that Kilgore and his men had already attacked prior to the attack that we actually see him command on a second village. In the same scene, one of the people in this queue waiting to be seen by a medic is holding a very large crucifix. Certainly that was meant to be visible to us. Look at the way it's positioned for, specifically for us to see. And a military priest is seen leading several US soldiers in prayer among the carnage. His prayer dialogue continues as a cow is lifted off by a chopper, which must be pretty damn scary for the cow. And his prayer dialogue faintly continues on into the nighttime campfire beach scene. I think all this is meant to show how institutional religion gets used as a psychological shield. The perpetrators of war atrocities convince themselves that they're doing God's work. Oh, one more biblical feature that I just want to mention for now, a more obscure one which occurs in two ways. The death cards that Kilgore throws onto the bodies of dead enemies, those cards have a bolt of lightning in their design. No doubt a metaphor of God striking down at the enemy, which is common in military insignia over the past century. For example, here's the British Union of Fascists flag. So, you know, it's got the same sort of jolt of lightning appearance. And at the end of the movie, the build-up to Willard killing Kurtz features flashes of lightning. An event of biblical proportions is about to happen. The idea that Kilgore and his posse view themselves as gods who swoop down from the sky and deliver retribution on their enemies is explored in my scene analysis video regarding the village attack scene, so I'll avoid repeating most of that stuff here. But there are one or two essential elements that are relevant to this video. The key thing is the music. Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries played by Kilgore's team as they attack from the skies. Ride of the Valkyries is a piece of music about the glory of death in battle and the transcendence of the bravest soldier spirits to the afterlife kingdom of Valhalla. The Valkyries themselves are spirit maidens, or angels if you will, who choose the bravest soldiers for acceptance into Valhalla. It's a centuries old ridiculous religious concept, and the psychological function of it was to fool mortal soldiers into giving their all in battle, even if it meant dying a horrible death themselves. It's the same basic promise of eternal afterlife that jihadists believe in. Along with the military preacher scene, this Valhalla-related music in the film suggests that Kilgore and his men subconsciously hold the same belief that to die in the battlefield represents some sort of glorious transcendence to the next life. But then we see a screaming injured soldier experiencing the reality of battlefield carnage as a couple of Vietnamese pray for him. Okay. 
They're praying for the people who are attacking them. And of course, it's to no avail. God doesn't care. His suffering continues, and a minute or two later, he'll be not so gloriously blown up and killed in the rescue copter. And I believe it's crucial that the ride of the Valkyrie's music disappears right before this grounded reality scene of battlefield suffering takes over. So much for Valhalla. I mentioned earlier in this video the sense of godliness in the vast open sky shots. Well, the undisputed dominant military force in terms of the Vietnam War skies was, of course, the US. They whiz about like flying Valkyrie maidens or sky gods, choosing who will live or die on the ground. And their flights are accompanied by trippy angelic singing in the musical score. The Wrath of God framing of military airstrikes from above is quite bluntly made at the end of the film. Willard outlines his airstrike coordinates to one of his men, and listen to the code word. Here, take the radio, and if I don't get back by 2200 hours, you'll call in the airstrike. <sighs> airstrike. The code is almighty, coordinates 0, 9, or 2, 6, 4, 7, 1, 2. And another example, easy to miss but very specific, is that one of Kurtz's operations described in his dossier was called Operation Archangel. The script doesn't have nearly as many religious references as the movie does, but here is one interesting moment. In parallel with the Ride of the Valkyries metaphor, Kurtz describes his men as being the chosen warriors of heaven. He mentions the Gotterdammerung, which is German for Twilight of the Gods. It's another piece of music with references to Valkyrie Maidens and Valhalla, just like Ride of the Valkyries, which Kilgore plays from loudspeakers in the movie. One more related detail before we move on. In the Redux version of the film is a sequence featuring an electronic variation on another piece of classical music related to war and religion. The original piece was Mars the Bringer of War, a 19-minute piece of epicness that served as the opening portion of Gustav Holt's orchestral suite, The Planets. Holt's title for the song is taken from Roman god mythology. Mars was the god of war. Here's an orchestral performance of the original piece. And here's the electronic variation used in Apocalypse Now. It carries on for several minutes of screen time as Willard reads the dossier about Kurtz, who has already been described as one of the best soldiers the US ever produced, and as a man who is revered like a god by his followers. This next theme blends in with the notion of Valkyrie maidens who swoop slain soldiers up from the battlefield and take them off to the beautiful afterlife of Valhalla. Apparently in the old Norse myths of Valkyries, these maidens sometimes would be lovers to live or dead soldiers, and their sexual desirability is certainly part of the package. Being taken off to the afterlife by a beautiful maiden or visited by a gorgeous ghost has its appeals. In Apocalypse Now, the Playboy models who arrive by helicopter like maidens from the sky, they are worshipped by hordes of horny soldiers. And I couldn't help notice a specific conceptual crossover. Don't know if this was deliberate or not. In Greek mythology, sirens were magical flying creatures whose appearance was part bird and part woman. These siren creatures were able to sing so beautifully and hypnotically that sailors would be overcome with desire for them and would throw themselves into the sea trying to reach the flying maidens, but they would drown. In this scene, the soldiers too were overcome with desire, not for the singing of these women, but for their bodies. And some of these men nearly drown trying to get to them or nearly fall to their death.
The sexual desirability of these women for these men is so intense that they have the alluring effect of a goddess or a siren. And this is actually quite common in sexual psychology. Men and women carry in their minds archetypal ghost-like impressions of the ideal mate, partially based on cultural impressions of attractiveness and partially on more personal things like impressions of our protective opposite-sex parents, um, our first childhood crush in school and so on. When we come across a person in the real world who vaguely matches up with our subconscious archetype of the ideal lover, we can be overwhelmed with desire for them. And a lot of people do very stupid things trying to acquire that person. The importance of the psychological archetype over the physical reality of the person is present in Apocalypse Now when Willard's crew stumbles across the playmates who are now stranded. One of these men insists on dressing the girl up to look exactly the way she did in the porn magazine pictures that he'd been collecting and had no doubt jerked off to many times. You were just kind of bending I mean, forward, really, just really the ass kind of out a little bit, and that's over there. That's it. That's it. That's, really it. that's very. That's it. <laughs> Voila. Beautiful. I collected every picture of her since she was Miss December, Chief. Hey, Queen, look at that. She was here, man. In another scene, he speaks of a fantasy he has had about walking naked in the jungle with Raquel Welch. For him, another archetypal, unachievable maiden. I'm walking through the jungle gathering mangoes. I meet Raquel Welch. You make a nice mango cream pudding. It's, you know, kind of spread it around on us. She's into mangoes too. She's like one limb above me. We're both in the jungle here nude. Hey, Chief! Willard doesn't seem to take as much interest in these Playboy girls. Instead, his siren is a ghost-like French woman later on. Although it isn't in the film, her night with him is revealed to be a subterfuge in the script. She lured him away like a siren so that the French soldiers could seize some supplies from the captain's boat, without permission. In the film, she appears as a supernatural being obscured by a veil and backlit by warm orange light, but he's unable to properly touch her through the veil. She's unattainable, and I think that's partially because she's a psychological archetype that can never be reached, and partially because Willard himself has become so cold and disconnected from others due to his war and espionage experiences. Oh, I'm sorry, Captain. It was just a little story about Paris and people starting going to the war. They are on the table, and there was a silence. Somebody said, an angel is passing by. So uh, somebody said, let's eat it. <laughs> Essentially, sirens and Valkyries of both sexes do exist and have existed throughout history, but they've only existed in the minds of men and women. We're all tormented by these angelic ideal mate impressions, forever seeking them out in the real world, even if we don't realise we're doing it, and we never quite find them. If we're lucky, we might find someone who superficially resembles our psychological archetype of the ideal mate. And mythology got around this problem by positing that only after we die can we finally access the ideal lover. And accordingly, military psychology has linked via the notion of Valkyrie maidens that glorious death in the battlefield is the ultimate portal for obtaining the ideal lover in the afterlife. In modern times, that's more of a subconscious thing. It's not spoken of in that kind of way. But it's also present in the common belief among soldier recruits that being a soldier will make one more able to attract their ideal mate in the flesh. Hell of a lot of soldiers sign up on account of a girl. The French guy here makes a statement that I think brings forth a theme spanning most of the movie. In the immediate context of this scene, I think his statement sneakily refers to he and his French comrades being ghosts of an army that once fought the same battle that the US are now fighting in the story. The French soldiers initially appear through a haze of white smoke like spirits and listen to the ghostly sounds as they do so. Ah! 
But I also think his statement that all soldiers know they're already dead absolutely applies to US soldiers, especially Willard and Kurtz. Willard himself drifts through the movie with a numb, dead look on his face, like the life has been drained out of him. In fact, according to available reports, Harvey Keitel, who was originally cast to play Willard, was taken out of the role because he couldn't do the deadpan look. Willard has seen a lot of death. He's killed people up close. How many people had I already killed? There were those six that I knew about for sure. Close enough to blow their last breath in my face. And it's like he died along with them. This dead-faced look is present in the faces of some other characters too. Colby, who has joined Kurtz, and the grenade launcher guy here. This whole nighttime scene is actually like something out of a supernatural ghost story. There are mysterious ghost-like elements in the sound. Captain, where are you going? See if I can find some fuel and get some information. And the place is full of trippy smoke and pulsing light. Even the lead-up to this scene features music that sounds like something out of a haunted house movie. And then there's this music, which sounds like something out of a scary funhouse ride. Approaching Kurtz's camp, the terrain and lighting takes on a valley of the shadow of death appearance. Look at these lovely shots. Arriving, there's a horde of Kurtz's followers covered in white paint or ash or something, looking like pale ghosts guarding the gates to hell. The live and the dead are mixed among each other in the compound as if there's no real difference between them. A weird detail I spotted here is that one of the followers holds up what looks like a makeshift cross. It doesn't look big enough to crucify a man, so I'm not even sure why it's there. Kurtz himself being godlike is akin to a ghost too. When he talks of the experience that sent him over the edge, he describes it as if he was literally killed by a gunshot to the head. I wanted to tear my teeth out. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I want to remember it. I never want to forget it. I never want to forget. And then I realized, like I was shot, like I was shot with a diamond, a diamond bullet right through my forehead. And I thought, my God, the genius of that. This is where Kurt psychologically broke. He died emotionally and became the messed up walking zombie that he's been ever since. And it's not uncommon. That kind of emotional deadness is often called the thousand yard stare. It's partially about the horrors that one has seen in war, though it's arguably underpinned more by the guilt of what horrors one has personally committed in war. We're never made privy to the exact reason why Willard drinks himself into oblivion and smashes his own reflection in a mirror at the start of the movie. This is before he's even given the mission to find and kill Kurtz. And the mirror smashing itself suggests self-hatred. Given his narrated confession at having killed six people up close, I think guilt is the cause of his anguish. Isn't it ironic that the act of murder can often cause a sort of psychological death for the one who commits the murder? We're taking her to some friendlies, Captain. She's wounded. She's not dead. The book says, Captain... Ah! Fuck him! I told you not to stop. Now let's go. After he executes this injured woman, he plonks himself down and he looks like he's back in that hotel room at the start of the movie, hating himself. Now he's crossed into Cambodia with this mountain yard army of his that worship the man like a god and follow every order, however ridiculous. 
Ten years before the release of Apocalypse Now, Charles Manson and his followers, who called themselves The Family, became infamous for carrying out the murders of five people in Hollywood. Like Kurtz and his followers, Manson was considered a father figure and his followers considered themselves to be his children. Why would a nice guy like you want to kill a genius? These are all his children, man, as far as you can see. Hell, man, out here, we're all his children. Like Kurtz, Manson lived away from society in a remote place where his followers were disconnected and thus easier to brainwash. Like Kurtz's followers, Manson's followers engaged in rituals. They took a lot of drugs too, and though it's not stated that drugs are a major factor in Kurtz's clan, the script does say that Kurtz's men use drugs when getting ready for battle. That's quite significant, isn't it? The movie itself has a bad acid trip feel to it. Lance drops acid, and he remains spaced out when he's at Kurtz's compound. He is then accepted as one of their own, while Chief, who doesn't trust them, is killed and beheaded. This Colonel guy, he, he's wacko, man. He's worse than crazy, he's evil. I mean, that's what the man's got set up here. Man is fucking pagan idolatry, look around you. The red coloured smoke in the compound also gives the sequence a drug fueled appearance. In the film, Kurtz's status as a god to his followers is mostly made visually in how he is contrasted against giant stone faced depictions of gods. Francis Coppola, the director of course, he described in a live audience interview with Roger Ebert that this is an Angkor Wat temple. Go and check it out on Wikipedia. Angkor Wat temples were built to worship the god Vishnu. There is this moment in the script too where Kurtz's will is described as the will of God. And there are moments that expand upon the absolute devotion to Kurtz from his men. I'll just put a couple of them on screen. Take a moment to read them. It's also typical of cult leaders to set themselves up with an endless supply of women. The only outright suggestion of this in the film is when Kurt speaks to Willard and is surrounded by children. Are these actually his own genetic offspring? This little moment in the script suggests that they are, and it's far more sexually oppressive of women than even Charles Manson was. Also common among cult leaders and Kurtz is the notion that the cult is destined to rise up and basically seize the earth away from its existing power figures. This is another facet of Kurtz that is definitely present in the script, but not stated outright in the film. Now my comparison with Kurtz and Charles Manson might seem initially unfair on account of Kurtz's efforts at explaining why he has committed the atrocities that he has, but a quick comparison with other more peaceful revered figures like the Dalai Lama or Gandhi, that puts into context just how dangerous Kurtz is. Sure, he might dress like those peaceful religious figureheads in his simple cloths, but his behaviour is more in line with the Genghis Khans of this world than the Charles Mansons. It doesn't matter how sophisticated the man sounds in his rhetoric, if his ideology leads to mass torture and murder, then he's no better than Charles Manson or Genghis Khan. He speaks of horror having a face as he shows his own face, which is about right. Horror has a face. And you must make a friend of horror. Horror and moral terror. Are your friends if they are not then they are enemies to be feared it doesn't take a great deal of thought to conclude that Kurtz essentially represents the dangerous edges within all men of military stature one of those edges is spoken of by the colonel who gives Willard his mission and he speaks of it as if it's an edge he is familiar with but out there with these natives it must be a temptation to be God. Incidentally, 
Kurtz reached the same rank, Colonel. Captain Willard also talks of Kilgore as if he has a magical godlike nature too. Well, he wasn't a bad officer, I guess. He loved his boys and he felt safe with him. He was one of those guys that had that weird light around him. You just knew he wasn't going to get so much as a scratch here. And Kilgore acts as if he is immortal, not bothering to duck when enemy mortars are bombing the beach, not even getting slightly scared when a flare goes off in the chopper and everyone else is panicking. He drinks coffee while there's a fight going on. So Kilgore and Kurtz are each representations of the subconscious tendency of military leaders to view themselves as transcendent beings, as gods, immortals. Kilgore may not speak of himself in such terms, but his behaviour spells it out, while the true nature of his delusions of godhood dwell in his subconscious. Kurtz is no more a god than Kilgore is, but he has embraced that view of himself in two ways. First he poses as a god to his followers, he may not even speak of himself as being a god, but he allows his followers to think of him and speak of him in that way, and says nothing to correct their assumptions. Most likely he deludes himself about his godhood motives by considering it to be a necessity for creating the army of perfect iron-willed soldiers that he's trying to create so that he can get rid of all the evils of the world by killing them. How ironic, but undoubtedly he enjoys his god status. The second way that he's embraced his subconscious desire to be a god is in his choice of reading materials. He has a copy of the Holy Bible. Now what use is that to a military commander who wants to win a war? He has a copy of From Ritual to Romance, a book about pathological elements of Arthurian legends finding their way into Christianity. Again, of what use is this to a military tactician? He probably thinks of himself as being like King Arthur. And the same goes for another book on his reading list, The Golden Bow. This is another religious-themed book. It includes the notion that every now and then, a king has to be sacrificed ritually and replaced by a new king. This is what happens in the film. Kurtz's clan hold a ritual in which they slaughter a bull at the very same time that Willard kills Kurtz. Kurtz had removed all the guards during his conversations with Willard, and he must have informed his clan that he would personally be sacrificed by Willard and that Willard would be their new king. Otherwise, there's no way that the clan would have allowed Willard to kill Kurtz, nor allow him to leave the camp alive. They would have tortured him to death. It's arguable that Kurtz even represented the dark side of Willard right from the very beginning of the story, and that Willard's journey upriver was essentially a journey along neurological pathways into his own deep subconscious, or a spiritual journey with the same purpose. The dreamy visuals and sound of the film support this. In his apartment scene at the start of the movie, an image of him caked in mud from the end of the movie is included in this sequence. Maybe that mirror smashing is actually a metaphor for half of Willard overcoming the other. By killing Kurtz, he's killing the darker half of himself, and it's a painful thing to do. And the French girl's statements to him, well... There are two of you, don't you see? One that kills, and one that loves. Like many viewers, I had previously come to the conclusion that Willard actually called in the airstrike at the end of the film to annihilate Kurtz's clan, and that the napalm montage at the beginning of the film with the song lyrics, This Is The End, was basically the end being shown to us in advance, so that the film exists in its own weird time loop. You know, you get to the end of the movie, and then you have to go back to the beginning of the movie to see what, what happened with the, the bombing. But this interview with Francis Coppola surprised me. He says that the opening montage was not intended to represent the bombing of Kurtz's clan, and that Willard did not call in the airstrike. Uh, so I went back and looked at that ending again. I was thinking, what's going on here? And yes, Willard's face is superimposed over the Vishnu god statues, showing that he is now the revered godlike leader of the clan. But that comparison was visually made at the beginning of the movie too, which seems to support the notion that the napalm sequence at the start of the movie is the ending. But when Willard leaves Kurtz's compound at the end, 
We hear his commanders trying to make contact with him while he ignores them, maintaining radio silence. And he did say slightly earlier that he wasn't even in their army anymore. They were going to make me a major for this. And I wasn't even in their fucking army anymore. So, going by that detail, it does seem that he didn't call in the airstrike. So, where exactly is he going now? Back to his commanders? Is he simply going to report that Kurtz is dead and that's it? Is he going to stay living in this jungle but mostly wander about alone, leaving his new followers forever wondering where he went? Coppola himself has said that the mutual dropping of weapons here was a positive hint that Willard is not going to lead these men down the violent path that Kurtz did. Although personally I think it's too late because they've already gone there and then some. The fact that he takes Lance with him suggests that he wants to take Lance back to civilization. And after all, Kurtz did ask Willard to visit Kurtz's own son and tell him everything that had happened here. So maybe we could consider Willard's own past tense narration of the story to be a representation of him telling the same story to Kurtz's son. It's quite a mysterious ending, but I do like that, despite being granted the status of godhood among this clan, Willard is not tempted to embrace his darkest violent urges, nor to justify them with delusional intentions as Kurtz did. The colonel who gave Willard the mission was right in his assessment. Because there's a conflict in every human heart between the rational and the irrational, between good and evil. And good does not always triumph. Sometimes the dark side overcomes what Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. Those two halves can't be integrated into each other. They are divisions that are eternal within us. We each must choose one path over the other. And the one that we don't choose has to be suppressed because we humans can never be purged of good or evil. Whether we choose good or evil as the basis of our existence, the side that we don't choose becomes the subconscious god or demon that haunts our dreams, and occasionally it pops up in fictional form as it does in Apocalypse Now. Thanks for watching, folks. You've been listening to Rob Ager. More film analysis at collativelearning.com. Bye for now.